afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't have never seen me before, um, I've been involved in European research since 1980. Now, how many of you were born before 1980? I think uh, just not too many. So, um, I started as a master student, PhD, project manager, and so on. So, this presentation took 40 years to prepare. So, I hope it will explain a lot of the things that are uh, in your lives. Now, two things you must understand about the European Union. It has 27 captains, so it takes a long time to decide what direction we're going. And the second thing you must understand about them is when they decide on a direction, they don't turn back. So anything they add to the program stays. So you can see a projection into the future also. Now, what I want to talk about first is some facts and figures about uh, the programs and so on. Now, in any program, you need to understand the rules and you need to understand the research. And you'll see that support offices are designed like this. And then I'll finish up with, what does this mean for your job? And some of you are showing, I'll show you how some organizations respond to this kind of evolution and so on. Now, the first thing you must understand here, sorry, is that the 27 countries come together and they produce a treaty. And the treaty defines where they work together. So they work together on innovation, economics, and so on. And for each policy, then there's a program there to uh, respond to that. So the main message from this slide is that whenever you see a program in Europe, it's there to support the policy on how the 27 countries are working together. Now, one of the big changes that happened since 2018 is they want more synergies between these programs. And COVID was a very good example. We used bits of each program to tackle a big challenge. So in 2018, there was a report published called the Synergies Report. Now, it said yes, Horizon 2020 and structural reforms, but it also expanded. So that's one of the big changes we're going to see over the next uh, number of years. Now, it officially it started in 1984, so um, here we have, uh, it was a four year program and at the beginning uh, most of the money in Europe went to farming. So agriculture got 60%, rural uh, structural funds, regional development got 30% and here um, research got less than 1%, between 1% and 2%. So it wasn't even a program, it was part of competition policy. And at the beginning here, a, a lot of the programs were focusing on solving specific uh, problems. Now, you can see the budget increased a little bit, but in framework 7, it became a seven-year program. So there was an automatic increase in budget because it was a seven-year program. And then we see a gradual increase here of the programs. So now it's about 8% of the European budget. Now, 95 billion comes up on the radar of national governments and also companies and so on. So, and the other thing that happened we can see here is we started off with 12 members, then 15, 25, 27, 28, back to 27 and what's going to happen in the future. So, um, so even though the budget is going up, the number of countries, and then you have the associated countries. So I want to show you what kind of trends have we seen over the years. Now, let's look at the rules. Now, at the very beginning here, there were no rules. In fact, if you were building a bridge and getting a research project, you got the same forums. Because there's only one set of forums and when the first program started, it was a total mess. So what they did is, during the first program, they had what they called additional rules that were introduced during the program. And when the next program started, they became the new rules. And during that program, they talk about time sheets, they talk about how we account for travel. If you're building a bridge, there's no travel, that sort of things. So as the programs are going along, they were making it up as they were going along. Now, to most people, this was seen as nightmare. For me, it was heaven, because I was following every single debate. So to me, the, my maxim was that 
mastery complexity was a competitive advantage. So to me, the more complex they made it, we were winning projects that other people couldn't get a look in. So for me, I was following all of these and evolving into the programs. But guess what happened? In Framework 7, when it became a seven-year program, people like Peter Hartwig and that, they sat down and they said, okay, let's start and stabilize the rules. So look what has happened over the last number of programs. Stability. So in other words, for people in the rules, you can see there's very little difference between Framework 7, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe. It is not simple. They talk about simplification. Simplification is not dealing with the word simple. Simplification is about consistency. And for the people dealing with the rules, that has been the major innovation. So for newcomers, OK, it's difficult to learn the rules. But once you learn them, they're practically the same. So I think that, and I think IARMA had a big role uh, in that kind of stabilization uh, process. So let's go on to the more interesting part for us. What happened the research? Now, way back here at the beginning, if you've got a German, an Irish, a Finnish, an Italian in a project together, it was already a success. So as long as we were even meeting uh, together, it was a success. So the whole idea was, let's get European researchers even talking to each other. Now, sorry, here then, in the first couple of years, it was focusing on technical problems, like increasing the efficiency of solar cells, building a robot, all of these kind of things. But in 1995, there was a famous book published called The Green Paper on Innovation. And for the first time ever, the word innovation appeared. And the Irish government was asked to nominate somebody on the committee, and I was the person. So I'm now sitting at the table listening to all of these debates. And so now they wanted to know, if we're putting money into research, should we be worried about what's coming out of the research? And in 1998, a report that nobody has ever read, called the Midterm Review of Framework 5, said that impact should become a main evaluation criteria. And here we are today, impact is the main evaluation criteria. That was 1998. So it was nearly seven years before it even became an evaluation uh, criteria. So you can trace impact originally back to 1995. Now, in the year 2000, there was a 40-page document called Towards a European Research Area. Uh, again, I don't think anybody read it, it's one of these books, but it had a major impact on the thinking in Brussels. 85% of the funding for research in Europe was being done at national level. And only 5% came from European funding. So they did experiments like Aeronets, JTIs, and all of these. In fact, they set up 120 different actions over 20 years. And today, these are the European partnerships in Pillar 2. I could do a whole lecture on how that evolved. Uh, the next thing that happened, a man called Henry Chesborough wrote a book called Open Innovation. And uh, the head of Philips Research, Siemens Research, took it on our holidays with him. I actually heard that story on, on one conference. He said, that's what I took on my holidays, summer holidays. And he came back and they changed the way that they did, they did research. Now, this had a huge impact on the thinking of how companies did research. That is the background to EIC in, in Pillar 3 today. So you can see the evolution in, in that. In Framework 7, the basic scientists learned how to lobby. They, they were sending reports to Brussels, the commission before that, but they started knocking on the door and having exhibitions in the European Parliament. So they decided to put money into basic research. It was a small budget, and that now has become the main ERC program that we see today. So before Framework 7, there was no funding officially for basic research. During the Swedish presidency, there was a document called the Lund Declaration. It said that if Europe is spending all this money, Europe should be doing things that the, the national countries uh, couldn't do. So Europe should face on the big challenges. And this is where the global challenges of Pillar 2 came. And the recent thinking is that to tackle a global challenge, 
you need portfolios of projects, not individual projects. So in Horizon Europe, Pillar 2, they want to know how does your project fit into the portfolio? So that kind of a thinking evolved over a number of programs. This is something we know very little about, people have very little about, heard about, but the presenter from the Commission this morning mentioned it. He just mentioned it in his presentation, something called the, the EU better regulation that they said, we need evidence to support our policy. And that's where impact on EU policy, which is what has been the main theme of today's conference, came from. So this is going to stick. And research feeding into policy making could even be the theme of the next EAMA conference, judging by this conference. Um, now, here's something nobody heard about. Europe said, the, the philosophy before this document was fund and forget. We put money into something, we have our job to walk away. And that was the kind of philosophy. But now they said, if we're putting all these billions into something, we want to see what's coming out. That has made real impact the theme. Not impact, not PowerPoint slides, not presentations, websites, conferences. They're now asking for real impact. And that's the theme running through uh, the Pillar 2 type activities. 2016, United, UN Sustainable Development Goals, and then they are now becoming the basis of Pillar 2. Every destination in Pillar 2, you can trace it back to a UN goal and target. So this is having a huge impact on the design of the program. Now, a midterm review is the first step in planning the next program. That's what it's there for. So the midterm review in 2017 here said, topics should be more open and bottom up. Look at the topics in Pillar 2 of Horizon Europe. My area is renewable energy, and it just says novel technologies for renewable energy. That's like a bottom-up program. So even the top-down programs are becoming bottom-up, where you're free to submit any idea that you like. Now, the midterm review said, adopt a mission-oriented, impact-focused approach to address global challenges. It's like bringing all the previous directions together into one sentence. That is where the missions came from. Now, one of the things I've noticed over my career is that when the Commission comes up with a new idea like the missions, they test it in Horizon Europe so it will be ready for the next program. So consider the missions as an experiment because the Commission is doing it. But one of the biggest changes that has happened to framework program in my lifetime happened in 2020. Because this commission was suddenly hand-delivered with a real example of a mission-oriented and impact focus to address a global challenge. And the scientific community proved that they could address it. It has completely changed the thinking in Brussels today. So all over the work programs is, we want you to do for climate change what you did for COVID. We want you to do for migration, for making Europe a leader in artificial intelligence. So since COVID, the game has completely changed. And now in Ukraine, I heard the sentence that energy policy is now security policy. So the whole thinking has changed. So are you getting ready for these kind of radical changes that are coming in the system? Now that's one way of thinking about it. I want to present it in another way. I want to use the famous TRL table for, you know, this is ready for application, this is fundamental research and so on. And I want to look at the evolution over the programs. Now, way back from framework one to framework five or six, it was solving technical problems, you know, and the more interesting, you know. Uh, so it was really a technical uh, program. In framework seven, they introduced the word social, technical, and social problems. So I've underlined what came in new. And in framework seven, they said, let's fund a little bit of basic research. Now, when we moved out to Horizon 2020, that became in, it's in now, so we can't take it out. Solving technical and social problems became global challenges, technical and social, because of the loan declaration. Now, in Horizon 2020, they introduced something called the SME instrument. Now, in fact, if you do the history of the SME instrument, it was a topic in framework five, a spring program. 
a tiny, tiny little topic, and the next problem is a little bit bigger and bigger. But here, they made it standard. So where are we today? Today now we are in Horizon Europe. We can see where Pillar 1 came from. We can see that Pillar 2 is addressing global technical and social challenges. SME instrument is making Europe a leader in the high-tech industry. And what I said in my very first slide, synergies with other European programs. So can you see what's happened? It's broadened, right? Now this happened without anybody noticing it. Because everybody's kind of just looking at me here now. You know, I'm looking at this next call. But if you're looking at it over 40 years, that slide that it took 40 years to put together because you couldn't see this happening in any four year period. Now what does this mean for support staff? For you, if I take this here, that's where we are today. Behind each one of those pillars is a different policy. And behind pillar two, every single topic has their own specific policy. And because of that, each program has a different type of partnership, different evaluation criteria, and different impact patterns. So it's very difficult for any one individual to be able to advise on the whole lot. So what we're getting in universities is specialities. We, we do ERC or we do Marie Curie. You can't say, I, I'm doing everything. It's practically impossible. I can do it because I've seen it evolve over the, the many years. And I think that's the slide when you're presenting to your directors why we need a support office. And we need a support office for Pillar 2, one for ERC, Marie Curie. And I see that as the big, big change that has happened over, over the years. Now, if we look at your offices, your offices are divided into research support for rules and research support for the research component. Now, your basic service, critical service, is, I call level one support. I presented this before. It's dealing with the rules. That's absolutely critical, even for the top scientists. For newcomers, they want to know, how do I fill in the forms? What, what does all output, outcome, and all impact mean? They want to know, what do the forms do? So, Level 1 and Level 2, every university, even the top ones in Europe, have that level. But what you want to know is, what do the really top universities do? Now, down here, it's all about efficiency. It's not about submitting 10 proposals to win one. We submit two and we get one. We submit one and we get one. You know, the, so people are high success rates. It's about streamlining the process. And you hear that all over the conference uh, today and tomorrow, how different organizations are doing. But this is the one, that's where we specialize, well, what we do in training, is how to screen ideas. You know, and that means understanding the evaluation process and so on. But my presentation today is talking about level five. And that is identifying trends and responding to trends. And there's a few of you in the audience you know, this is what you do, you full-time monitoring what I've been talking about. Now, so if I was presenting to your, your board about how to organize, are you presenting to your board about your support services? Some of you, that is where you live. When the call comes out, we're there to help the scientists. But when the draft work programs come out, they need a different support. And when the policy has been prepared, that's a totally different support. Now, if somebody arrives at your desk on the week of the deadline, you should say, we can make coffee for you. you know? <laughs> and, and that's all you can do. We can be down, relax. The deadline's at 5 o'clock, you know. So when you're presenting your services to the scientists, you can say, if you arrive on the day that there's coffee on the, de on the room, if you arrive two months before the deadline, we can give you a lot of help. But if you contact us when the call comes out, we can talk to the NCP, talk to previous evaluators, and we can give a super service. That's how you should present it. But when I visit the centers that have high success rates, they start back here. The first drafts came out six weeks ago. I know some universities that are analyzing topics already, proposal intelligence, and all of these things. But the top groups, they start back here. And here is where the strategic planning, and I know some of you that are even 
a level before that, where they're looking four or five years down the road. So can you see that if you're a, a, an advanced university, that's the kind of planning and, and some of the success. I know one guy, I, I watch, I follow him on LinkedIn. He's working five years ahead. There's a big project coming soon. I can just feel it. He's been, I saw, you know, so the people, Analyze the people that are really, really successful in the top-down programs. ERC is different because it's 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 bottom, it's bottom up. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, and I will be putting a video of this online if anybody wants to play it, I'll put it up. So thank you very much for your attention.